So let's start. Hopefully you can hear me. And um, yeah, welcome to today's question and answers. So what I thought is a lot easier to um, answer a couple of questions at once instead of writing um, millions of comments. So um, just a test. Can you actually hear me and see me? Um, I think so. It looks great. So um, the first question is um, from my blog and um, the uh, Jeff Picklick asks uh, how to, to uh, convince ivory tower decision makers to leave plain old Tomcat and Spring in favor of Java 6 or 7. I wouldn't even try this. So I, I would say um, Tomcat and Spring are viable option to Java 6. So if you have, um, this is um, the question number one uh, from my blog. This is the from Jeff Picklick. So if you, um, if you ha have already Tomcat and Spring and you are satisfied with it, um, j migration to Java 6 or Java 7 will end up in very similar architecture and even code. So um, I would say having Tomcat or Jetty with Spring or having um, Java 6 on the application server are perfectly viable uh, options. What's a little bit crazy is to running uh, Spring on an ap Java 6 capable application server or Java even Java 7 capable application server. Why it's so crazy? Um, yeah, because you get lots of the applications. So Spring supports dependency injection. CDI and Weld are supporting dependency injection. So uh, the question is um, why you would like to do this, right? So um, I would say if you have Java 6 or Java 7 application server, uh, Spring DI, Core Spring, is uh, is a little bit crazy because you get too, too many annotations, too much duplications. But if you're running Tomcat on Jetty, with Spring, it is a viable stack to Java 6. But then I would um, rather invest in, uh, I think Pivotal is the name of the company behind Spring right now. And they have a hardened Tomcat called, as I think the name is T-Server. So I would rather use T-Server than Tomcat and then run Spring on T-Server. Um, and uh, whether you use Spring or Java 6 is not our decision as architect, it's rather a decision from the, uh, from the customer sponsor or whoever has the money. So we as architects or developers should um, explain the options. So Java 6 full stack with nothing, um, with, without any dependencies if possible, or using um, a Spring on Jetty or Tomcat. So I think this question is um, hopefully answered. Uh, yes, hello is on yet. So I think it's answered. Are you satisfied with the answer? If no, then write me, drop me a tweet or chat. Yeah. I'll write something to chat. Let's see whether you are actually satisfied. So there is no feedback, no news are good news. So let's approach with the next one. Uh, I actually pick all the questions from my blog. So, um, uh, and these were the, 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 the latest questions. So uh, Andreas Hauf Haufle asks, do I even need or ask it states actually is excerpt from his comment, do I need, uh, even need a Java E monster? So I would argue no Java E monsters anymore. So if you use a reasonable application server, like for instance, um, how it's called, um, Glassfish, Whitefly, um, Tommy, of course, uh, Tommy is uh, not even, you know, a, a cute uh, insect, <laughs> I would say. It's very, very lean. So uh, it is uh, not, not monster at all. Um, and even the uh, web is is, uh, is is pretty lean right now. So um, the web Liberty profile is, is, is very, very, very small one. So it's not a question of, 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 of size, I would say. Scalability can be achieved at a much lower price. So actually, in Java, there is no price. So um, um, you, you get the most application servers for free. And if you, if you like, you can, you can buy support, but it's uh, actually not mandatory, which is good. So, so at one point of time, if your company becomes successful, you will have, you will have to make the decision, would you like to uh, buy support and save time? Or uh, if you have time, you don't have to buy the support. So actually, it is the decision. Um, and for instance, I, I, I bought support for my Linux box uh, for, 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 for Linux operating system. So it's actually not unusual to buy support, but you don't have to. And this is actually a good business. And then state something like in terms of learning curve and complexity. So the problem with the statement is actually at the end of the days you will end up having something like 
Java E, or at least you, will, uh, you would like to have dependency injection. You would like to have uh, some notion of configuration of data sources and, and connection pooling. You would probably also have, would like to have uh, transactions or at least something like binding context to threads or scope. And of course, you would like to have proxies. So um, you can get rid of Java E completely and just develop for half a year. And then at the end of the day, you will end up with ha having something similar. And um, I did it actually several times before J2E. So we built lots of application servers, web frameworks, whatever. But at one point of time, you have to concentrate on business logic. And from my point of view, um, Java 6 or Java 6 and 7 and even Java 5 were perfectly viable for most enterprise applications. And, and, and the teams were absolutely productive with it um, if they concentrate and focus on the business logic. If you focus on uh, the technology and not the business logic, so we'll end up uh, implementing layers over layers and patterns and, and forget about your customers. Yeah. And um, controversial 80 characters makes width. So I just um, makes width, so there's a typo here. So I actually um, wrote, um, I hope, wait a second. I have to get your feedback. Otherwise, I will have to restart the whole stream. So is the question answered? So is, are the questions answered? Are the questions answered? They can chat what's un answered or not. If no, no feedback is good feedback. Perfect. So, um, wait a second. Just waiting. Ah, how you would do that with JSR 236? Um, 236, what do you mean by 236? You mean pulling concurrency utilities, I think? And I read the world hacks in J2 and there you throttle X-ray for statistic versus statistic, static thread pool. Uh, static thread pool. I forgot actually what I did. No, it wasn't me. Someone refers to my open source project and um, I started a project in a train and uh, actually it, um, <laughs> and, and someone actually um, took over the project and, and developed two weeks for full time. And it turned out that it was, I think, uh, Canadian government and they wanted to, to, to gather the uh, statistic from several, from several uh, application servers and they implemented the thread pool. And this was before Java 7 and I think they used static thread pool, but I plan to uh, remove this altogether because I don't need this and um, we would like to migrate to Java 7 and even and the recent air hacks workshop, we decided to, 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 to start a very lean project. It was called Lightmoon. So with, together with the uh, attendees of the workshop, where is it? It is an empty repository. And this one is going to be even leaner than the, than the, um, than the Lightmoon. But it was actually a good feedback, at least um, interesting. So question answered, yes, perfect. So I think, I hope, from Christian Chi, the question is answered, hopefully. If not, we can discuss, really. So um, we can remove the, the thread pool and, and, and replace it with uh, concurrency utilities. And uh, I think the guy who, who was behind the, um, the implementation of the thread pool used um, asynchronous first, but it wasn't possible to set, set the max pool threads on Glassfish back then, and then he decided to use the thread pool. This is the whole story, uh, inside a story behind Lightfish. And the project was Light Moon. Light. Moon, oh, the first one. This is why it didn't found us. So this is the project, and we will just pick the core from Lightfish and start over with Java 7, and of course, Java 8, Lambdas, and all the goodness. Okay, uh, next one. I hope it's answered. Christian Chi on he, are you happy with the answer? Hopefully. Yes, thank you. So uh, controversial 80 characters max width. So I wrote a blog post that actually it's um, ancient, uh, comes from ancient times, the 80 characters max width. And I don't really get it because um, so if you create something on or open a file on NetBeans, you will see later a, 
um, red line. This is the 80 width, uh, uh, weighty, 80 characters width. And um, I have no problem with it, but uh, sometimes what I saw in projects that the um, either you get stretch formatting or you have to rename your variables. And if you are using lots of um, lots of generics, and it was actually before uh, before the diamond operator, it wasn't actually really hard to write expressive code without breaking the rule. So what I just uh, just mean by that, it is better to write expressive code which is um, w w with, uh, with larger than 80 characters. I would go with one, 120 or 160 uh, before I, I just uh, have to to, to reformat the whole code for for inch, for purposes we forgot about, just to fit you know some strange rule from 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 the 60s. So this was actually the uh, the idea of the post about X, uh, 80 characters with. I got lots of comments and I actually I, I couldn't even respond because um, it was like I mean it was more more religious topic than than actually with uh, with some uh, matter behind. And uh, on that note. Um, yeah, forget it. So, now next topic: um, JavaFX and ClassPath. So it was a very basic question: What's the deal with JavaFX and ClassPath? So if you if you uh, uh, deploy JavaFX, sometimes uh, you get problems that the platform class cannot be found, and sometimes it work. What's the deal with it? And um, so, what, what's the deal with with this? Is um, I think starting with JavaFX, uh, JDK one seven. Update 45, I think. Um, suddenly, J um, JavaFX, um, all JavaFX classes were in the class path. Before this, you had to uh, put, if you have, for, for instance, used Maven, you had to push the JFX um, rt.jar. Uh, what I did, I put this as a system dependencies to uh, POM XML. So it was in the class path. And uh, right now, with JDK 1.8, uh, absolutely no problem at all. As the recent Java uh, JDK 1.7 is also not a problem. If you are using an older version of JDK 1.7, then you can then you can get some 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 stranger um, uh, problems. Like um, if you are building with Maven, it won't find your classes. Or if you just start uh, JavaFX from the command line, you will have to put JFXRT in the class path. So um, I hope it's answered. Um, Alberto Gori asks from my uh, blog if, okay, he assumes that uh, there is some performance implication with flushing and say, if this is true, I would say better to call EM clear just after EM flush for better performance. And uh, he actually, um, uh, this was the, the question with Hibernate, he, he, he worked with um, Open Entity Manager and find out that flush can t take some time. So how Entity Manager, should operate. So the entity manager for the duration of the transaction, this is the def default behavior, they have um, to remember all the entities and in case uh, an entity changes, they, they, they have to keep track of all the changes. And at the end of the transaction, they call basically flush. And what flush does, it uh, flushes the changes, so computes the changes and flushes the changes to the database. And uh, what commit does, it just basically says JDBC connection uh, commit. And um, so if you call clear after flush manually, um, what will happen then, it will clear the cache um, and will just send the, um, the, the commit to the database. So um, what it actually means in, in, uh, in transactional entity manager, flushing and clearing will have basically uh, no effect on performance. If the entity manager is extended, you you have sometimes to call clear. Otherwise, you will end up objects. You will get more and more objects in your entity manager in so-called unit of work, and um, and you will get even problems with uh, memory. So uh, you, if you call clear, it will basically detach all the entities. And this is sometimes too much. This is why in Java 6 em.detach was introduced, which basically detaches a single entity. Hopefully, answered right now. Ah, oh, Christian Chi already started to clean Lightfish. I think this is actually the attendee from the AHEX, and uh, he does something behind the scenes, but uh, I will start with Light Mode if I'll get some time. Um, oh, nice to have my attendees. So welcome, Christian. This is actually his name is Christian. Yeah, Christian. Okay. 
Um, yes. Um, Manted Pauli, you state you never design your application by technical structures. If I say never, never is relative. Uh, I would say most of the time. So you shouldn't be dogmatic in software design. So um, if I say never, I say I attempt not to do this. If, if there is no other way, I would just do it. So, um, but where you pack exceptions, and this is a very interesting question because of all my recent code reviews, all exceptions got an exception package. So, um, especially if they are used through the whole project, which is also interesting. So where I put exceptions, the, the <laughs> question is, not where I put the exceptions, but where the exceptions are usually. Because who cares about me? This is about you know the popularity of such decisions. And if you looked at JDK, Java E, for instance, I don't think there is any exception package. So the exceptions are within the package where the exception can happen. So um, if you if you I think I hope not think and hope if we get uh, I would just like to start small Java project uh, test and um, yeah for instance JDBC exception is in the root S uh, or sorry SQL exception is in the if the in, in the root of Java SQL dot um, where all the JDBC lives there's SQL exception there's no dedicated exception package then um, I don't know the concurrent Modification exception, for instance, is in Java Util, where it actually happens if you traverse the iterators in um, concurrently, you get the exception there, uh, the exception there, and this is um, exactly where it happens. So for me, exception is just an object, like um, class uh, EJB POJOS R is just no difference between an exception and usual Java class. So I wouldn't also not never put a Java class to a package class and an interface to package interface, an abstract class to package abstract. So I would never do this. And um, never, yeah? I would usually not do this. And um, so um, so what uh, what I just say, what I would just do, just put exception where, where it belongs. And now the question, especially if they are used through the whole project, what I tend to do is to organize my project after, after business responsibilities. So what it actually means is, I will show you. What it actually means is the following. So um, I will, I would have, I would have a package, for instance, business. I'm referring to Java E right now, and a package called orders, and I don't know metrics on whatever we get, get, and these are actually business terms here. And if the exception belongs to the whole project, I will put it right here in the root. If the exception just be, uh, belongs to the orders, I will put the exception just to the orders. And if the exception belongs to business, presentation, and integration, I will put the exception right there, which is probably the name of the project. So the name of the project would be, um, I don't know, um, happy selling, right? HS dot, and there will be presentation, business, and integration. And uh, the um, generic exception will be here, the exception which belongs to all presentation components here, exception which belongs to all business components here, and exception which just belongs to the orders here. So I would say it's not only obvious, I mean, there is no other way to do this, right? Because anything else, uh, you will have to invent your own structures. I hope, Manfred, the um, answer is, the question is answered, hopefully. If not, just ask the next time, I will try to answer it in May. <laughs> So, um, also a good one. Yasa asked, um, try to, um, try to my, 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 my older example. What I usually do, I use, um, I, I write actually the following for unit testing. It's imagine if this were an EJB uh, or an, an POJO, a Java EE something, and this Java EE something needs an, another object which is going to be injected another thing and the a java is something a java is something oh no another thing and what's at so what i'd never do i don't write here private 
So I would, uh, in Java E, I don't have the class path here, but I will just inject this here. And in my unit test, Oh, just download the JUnit. Just I always do it with Maven. The first time I do it without Maven. Okay. No JUnit. So in the JUnit test, I will just set the uh, the reference directly, and setting the reference directly is only possible if the unit uh, JUnit class and the and the package class reside in the same package. And uh, they, they do, of course, because in the source test Java, the package would be the same test, so I could perfectly inject this class, but uh, oh, nice, it worked. I was too fast. So, um, okay then, we could, I, could <laughs> I can even show you this. Um, what was it? Um, a Java E something, class under test. And then I would get, um, oh, I need a whole bandwidth for the streaming. This is why it was so slow. Um, void init. Let's say here uh, before, let's change it to three, okay. And then say this class under test dot add and we'll set it directly, right? And mock it or just create as another topic how to mock, but we'll just set the another thing directly, another thing directly. So this is what I would do. And the problem is of course, if you, if you say here, this is private, I get here, in the test class, an error. And um, what, what I could do, but this I will never do really, what I could do, which is really strange, you could say, now I expose this via get and setter. And now this is public. If this were an EJB, now you could really set the dependency here via public getters and setters, which is really, it, it, it breaks the encapsulation. Doing this this way, it wouldn't break the encapsulation because what, whatever is injected is a proxy. And even if you would see this, uh, this reference in the proxy, you couldn't just change it because, um, yeah, because it's a proxy. So now everything is hidden. With public getters and setters, you would violate the encapsulation. With package uh, getters and setters, it would work a similar way, but you will end up having three times the, the amount of code, and the question is why. Okay. Um, I hope we covered this. Oh, someone is uh, converting uh, Lightfish to scripting one last one, which is also cool. Uh, yeah, nice thing. So uh, NAS one is is great. So um, I'm using NAS one if if, if 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 other projects like SPG. And uh, yeah, go for it. Um, just in chat, I got uh, feedback that Jeff is, try is trying to migrate Lightfish with Nashorn. So just do it. So Lighthorn would be a nice name for your project. <laughs> so um, thank you. Um, so I, I think we answered the question from Yasser, hopefully. And Team B asks me, if you have two applications communicate via REST and DTOs are forbidden, and you know me, DTOs are not forbidden, but doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you like, just use DTOs. But what I say, I don't use them because they are, they are not forbidden. They don't make any sense according to the, to, the origin, to the origin idea from Sun. How do you share the model between those two? And uh, the question is more political than technical, actually. So if you have two applications they, and they have to communicate, if uh, the application A, let's say, I think I have to draw again. So um, let's go to the drawing board. Let's say we have two applications. And the application A offers services to application B. If you offer the DTO for the application B, you will have to maintain the DTOs and um, you have to keep them in sync for application B. But if you just offer the RESTful interface here, it doesn't even have to be type safe. It's a design decision whether it is type safe or not. Then the application B could use DTOs, uh, a, a map or even a JSON object to do whatever the application B likes and be longer compatible that you could even provide. This is more a political question about the contract here. And really, 
um, you get the binding actually for free on the, on, the, on the client side. You could even use completely different framework than on the server side. So I wouldn't limit the uh, application B for, for using the A. Having that said, what I always do on the, on the B side, I would encapsulate the whole REST service in a, in a class which corresponds with a component on the server side and naming accordingly, if this were orders, I would get here the orders on the server side. And the servers on the on the orders on the server side would be just one class which provides a nicer API to the to the JaxOS, um, because even even uh, if JaxOS is is really very very lightweight and and very uh, very easy to use, it is um, it, it, the whole application doesn't have to be the whole client doesn't have to be depending on on on, on the JaxOS on all the APIs and having this encapsulation would work out and. Um, Sharing the model, I mean, if you look at the most of the internet services, there is no, no model sharing at all. You get the um, JAXA REST, sorry, no JAXA REST, the REST specification, and you have to, only you have to just use it in whatever language you like. And if you are building DTOs, you are already assuming that the two applications are built in Java, which doesn't have to, to be the case. And um, what you can always do, of course, provide the DTOs like a goodwill to the other application, say, look, we have something for you, you can use it or not, just to, to test it, for instance. And um, what I usually do, I start, uh, if I build RESTful web services, actually I start with the system test, with the unit test, and then I'm forced to think about how to interact with the service, and as a, I would say, collateral damage, I get DTO's JSON object or the API, and sometimes I give the API to the other applications. Sometimes not. It really depends on the other department applications or what the you know political uh, climate is between two departments, right? <laughs> okay. I hope it is covered right now. But um, I would say JaxOS is absolutely not about DTO's. Um, okay. Um, Christian mentioned he would like to start the moon, uh, light moon. What I will do soon, I will extract the essential parts for Glassfish to light moon, write a simple test, and then uh, make it work probably, and extend it to some more interesting stuff. So, um, that's the idea. Um, so, the next question. How once generates REST client stubs in Delphi for Java endpoints? There is still no widespread visible-like tools for REST. This is actually a very similar question to the question number eight from Tim. And uh, I'm not sure about Delphi, but, um, but in all other languages, you can very, easy to interact with, very easily interact with HTTP. So the question is not REST. The question is whether Delphi is, is able to deal uh, efficiently with JSON. And we can just test it, Delphi, JSON, binding. And let's see whether something like this is actually there. And there's even Delphi JSON Viewer. So it seems like Delphi, they have nice integration with, uh, with JSON. It looks reasonable. And there is, so I would say, even in Delphi, there's actually no problem. So um, I assume Delphi is able to inter interact via, via um, HTTP with the uh, Java e backend server. This is my assumption. If yes, with, and you have JSON binding, I would say with a few lines of code, you have the communication done without any vistals. And the um, vistals or web service description language sounds nice in theory, but in practice, it's um, um, it's only works between Java and Java or .NET on .NET. If you try to be a little bit more cross language, you have you don't you have to 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 make the API simpler to make it work. And we had already problems with dates, even strings and uh, end of lines and and whatever. And uh, on that note, I reviewed a lot of SOAP based services, but I actually never saw a really nice business driven whistle. All the whistles I saw were just you know, misuse of SOAP in terms of remote procedure call. You could, you could equally well use remote method invocation, just call the methods. You don't need, you know, business specification or whistles to do this. So this was actually the, my, my, my feedback to whistle. And there are whistle-like tools that they are even built into NetBeans. 
uh, I don't, there's not a J2E project, but there is um, usually uh, generate REST client, yeah. So you could um, point to a, to, a, to a resource class and it would generate a client. I would never do this because, or at least do it once to see how it looks like, but then you will see it is very easy to build, is a one liner to call a resource. And this is your code, you can just format as you like. So I don't like generate code a lot, generated code a lot, but even um, it built without any plugins, NetBeans 8 or even 7 provided you plugin to, um, to generate uh, RESTful clients from, from, from a resource class. And Glassfish comes with, or Jersey comes with VADL, Web Application Description Language. It is somehow proprietary, but at least documents the, the, the endpoints. I hope the question is answered. Um, okay, very good question. So let's answer this straight away. So Christian asks, what type of apps you would like to see doing a better job using Node.js on server side and which one better with JEE? Uh, so what Node.js is, it is a server side framework, which uh, a single solid framework, but uh, callback based. Um, what it actually means is um, you can, um, you have to be fully asynchronous to make it efficient, so you shouldn't block. So if you call the database, you just fire and forget the question, the select to a database, and you get an answer back if the um, database is ready to answer. So it's a really interesting programming model, Node.js. And uh, so what Node.js is perfectly suited for is, for instance, like uh, chat applications, <laughs> probably the social stream even we're using right now, or the social chat. Is um, is uh, is Node.js based? Who knows? Um, probably <laughs> um, something like this, or uh, you know, um, in applications with lots of messages. Uh, Twitter, Twitter could be a good good thing. And um, I would say I'm thinking more and more about integration. So if you have a C code, legacy C code, it I would say it is a lot better to use Node.js to integrate the C level code and then expose the C level code or C plus plus code via REST like service and consume the service from Java E app. This is a lot better approach than even writing a JCA connector uh, and using JNI to interact with the C code because if uh, JNI breaks, it will kill your server. So what I used in the past, I used remote method invocation to isolate the legacy process from the application server process. And with, and with, uh, with, um, uh, node, it would uh, node will decouple this, and this is this is actually would be a nice uh, nice use case for for node. But I but I think it is um, hard to use node for uh, for building uh, web apps or boring database applications. Then I think is uh, Java well better suited for. And you shouldn't forget Avatar JS. This is um, Node JS on Java E actually. So. Um, if you have to use Node, look at this. It uses NAS Horn and um, and um, and uh, Node. And they they built even they they implemented the native um, Node layer in um, uh, so you can run Node JS applications on Java e application server and even interact with um, or with Java e components. Okay. And uh, the also interesting question via Twitter. So I had a nice conversation with John Boyarski about ignore in unit test. What I wrote is actually ignore in unit test should be forbidden or at least deprecated. And I got lots of interesting comments. Um, and why I think this way? Because what what often happens, I don't know whether it's a general rule or not, or what I see in project is like, if something doesn't work, it gets even, it was commented out back then, right? And what I did, I wrote a comment, uh, um, delete uncommented uh, code. Uh, uh, and uh, so with at ignore, there is no more commented out code. They just put at ignore on the test and forget about this. So there are lots of unit tests with at ignore for, you know, for multiple releases. And what I would say, meanwhile, I think at ignore is useful as a temporary tool but you shouldn't check in unit tests with at ignore on them. I would say this would prevent, you know, the 
degradation of the quality of the code. So sometimes I put ignore if you would like to test something quickly. I know it will break my test, but I attempt at least not to check in something with that ignore. Hopefully you won't find something in the uh, GitHub repositories with that ignore. But this is at, at least my attempt, and I thought more and more about this, and actually will avoid to use ignore in future, or this will be my attempt altogether, because I think it causes lots of uh, harm, and uh, I don't know whether the, what is actually was there is what is the balance between the benefit and the and, and harm using at ignore. So um, now I will ask the chat again whether they have any questions, and I have one. No, there's actually no. I think. No more questions from chat, then I will go. I got eight questions today uh, on my blog. And uh, the question is here about um, transaction attribute not supported in persistence context type extended in entity manager and describes some behavior where uh, Hibernate can behave strangely. And the problem is also the um, transaction attribute not supported is not propagated and so forth. So. Um, First, what's really uh, important, there is an unsynchronized context in, in Java 7. So um, then Hibernate should behave and Eclipse Link and all others as well. Second, um, I, um, I don't suggest the, uh, this architecture for, for, for everything. It is a specific kind of applications. And uh, if you're building such applications, you don't have to propagate a context. And um, why not? So back to the drawing board. Um, why not? Because. So what, um, because, usually I get one EJB, this is EJB, and I call this gateway. It is uh, a kind of antifacade, and this gateway publishes to the outside world entities. And the entities are attached. So on this gateway, all the methods comes with transaction level unsupported. And one method, I often call it safe, starts and ends a transaction, which causes the um, entity manager to flush. So the UI um, uses directly the gateway without any indirections to find the entities or set of entities, works with these entities, and then the end of the work, it's called safe. And then everything is flushed to our database. So I will never, I don't need here any propagation because there's nothing between. And what could happen, of course, that this needs a service, but this service is just an usual service and is uh, usually stateless and uh, would even use a transactional entity manager, but usually from different persistence unit, not, not the same one. So this is the basic architecture. And when I would like to use it, so we had, I think we spent at the last air hacks, um, at least three hours discussing this. And I think in the, in, in, in the last day, or on, there was, an, was a little bit beer, it was the uh, Wednesday, we committed that it actually how to, how, to, how to tackle the problem. So there are some specific kind of applications, I would say, which are network based, so sort of like transport system or some computations of nodes and stuff like this. And imagine you have on server lots of nodes like, you know, ways, waypoints or something like this with different um, uh, qualities or numbers or whatever, which can be computed and it could be even persistence and they, they are built with JPA. So and there's a huge graph of objects, right? And on the client, you only, you are not capable to transfer everything to the server. So just a subset. So on the client, if you only need a subset and you do some operation, you cannot just merge back this thing with this because the server had no idea what happened. So what you will have to do, you will either transport, you know, to clone the whole thing here and compute the delta, or what you can also do if the client is on the server, like for instance, in this case for JSF and most web apps, you could keep the entity manager open and manipulate the graph online and then save the changes to the database. So um, and this is what I refer and this is, um, I don't suggest often, I would say, in fact, I use it very rarely in my projects, I would say one project out of 10 uses such architecture, but in, in case you need it, you really have to go this way. Otherwise you will spend um, 
an infinite amount of time just creating DTOs, got facades, and, and the whole infrastructure, and you actually forgot about the, the uh, business logic. Okay, uh, let's see. We planned 15 minutes. It's a little bit longer, but I think it's not a problem. So, um, how Davide asks, um, I think is also an, an ear hacker. So, uh, he asks, how can you propagate a back-end exception, for example, an op optimistic log exception to the front-end GSF or JavaFX? Um, so, this example is really bad because it will cause discussion. So, this particular example, but uh, imagine it's something else, not optimistic log exception, an another exception. How, how I would propagate this? Um, so, if, if I would use JAXOR as services, uh, what I would do, I would um, catch the exception somewhere, and this exception transform to HTTP code. Um, this particular one, or let's stick with this. Let's go with this exception, optimistic log exception. What it actually means, it means there are two users, two windows, and they fight with each other <laughs> to get access to the same entity on the server, and uh, one wins and the other loses, and the server um, recognizes the inconsistency and throws optimistic log exception, which uh, which causes the detachment of all entities and rollbacks the 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 whole uh, transactions, and you get this exception in particular. What's bad with this optimistic log exception is sometimes it happens at the commit time, and what you have to know is um, is the following: in uh, on the application server everything or the EGBs are proxied. So your method is here, but actually the method is invoked by, by a proxy. So the proxy will call begin here and commit here so that the exception may happen after the method was actually called. This is probably what, 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 uh, what Davide asks here. So um, in this, in what, what's happened then? What do, you, what do you have to do then is um, you have to create an interceptor and within the intercept of begin and committed transaction, then you will be able to catch this. And this is actually a specific case. And because when you catch the exception, what it actually means is, it means the one of the users is faster than the other. And what it usually means in practice, it means some, is something wrong with the business process. So actually the optimistic lock exception is rarely a technical one. It is in most cases has to be transformed to a business error. So what you will have to do then is to um, throw another exception like uh, inconsistent, uh, the <laughs> another user was faster than you exception, for instance, and then think about a um, proper HTTP code and write the message with a X message. This is what I would do. Or um, X error header, additional header as additional information to the client. This is what I would do. And there is another, a great um, interface called Exception Mapper. And the Exception Mapper interface in JAXRS allows you to map exceptions to HTTP codes. This is a little bit harder because um, it depends when the exception is, um, is, is, is caught, you know, when the transaction, where and when the transaction is committed. I hope David is as crystal clear right now, hopefully. See? No questions? What's, uh, where is Twitter stream? Yeah. Also nothing? Ah. ah, I got uh, another two questions. Marek uh, Zion asks, what about the message persistence when using async annotation? Um, so the basic, <laughs> basic answer, there is no persistence. What um, I think he, uh, Marek refers to asynchronous, and what asynchronous means is that uh, the um, the message is put first in the queue and then consumed by the then consumed by by a thread pool. What can happen if the server dies? Uh, it it behaves like a transient message. Um, Adam, when you would use the async annotation over traditional GMS queues. Um, you could replace uh, transit queues with uh, with this because transit queues is the same quality as an asynchronous, and um, if you could even replace um, you could even replace 
persistent queues with uh, single action timer, which is persistent. And um, why to do this? Sometimes it is really hard on the server to uh, to create queues. Or, or f I was in companies where we were not allowed to use queues from specific vendor or whatever. So um, it's a little bit of hassle, but uh, uh, CDI and and at asynchronous works everywhere. But um, events, the CDI events is very natural. It is actually observable in Java E. This is the implementation of the observer pedal in Java E. And JMS is a queuing system. So if you are misusing JMS for for eventing, I would say, then you could use CDI events. But uh, you should never replace the, uh, the messages with deliver once and only once quality um, to uh, uh, replace JMS with CDI events and or asynchronous uh, processing. I hope, Marek, the question is answered, hopefully. Was wrong, uh, wrong tab on Twitter, so this is why I answered the question half hour later than planned. So, back to the questions. Um, Davida, I think, covered. What do you recommend for Java 7 beginners in, in terms of getting expertise in building enterprise class applications? I think there are no more enterprise cl class applications anymore, if, you th if I think about this. So what enterprise could mean a little bit more thoughts on quality, this could be enterprise for me. But if you think on consumer apps, they, 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 the scalability is even greater than, 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 than most enterprise apps. So, um, but I think I know what what uh, Abhishek means is he Abhishek means um, I think that uh, you know to use all the Java API. Where to begin? Yeah, for instance, start with something like Lightmoon. What I did before Java E five came out, I hacked my heating system. The project is still online called Greenfire. It was the um, I used JBoss back then and the uh, I remember it was so early implementation that even even the packages were wrong for for dependency injections. So I had to recompile the whole application because it, it broke on on, on the uh, JBoss release. But this is how um, I learned Java E5 before before Java E5 and J2E before Java, J2E. As J2E 1.4 came out, I wrote for me and I think a star search uh, um, application which uh, imported s several hundred thousand stars and visualized the stars. So my brother helped me even with the vis visualization and with the backend system and just to test the performance and I tested the performance of different servers. So I would say um, if, you, if you have a hobby, then just hack the application and uh, put it on GitHub and, and, and get feedback. This is um, probably not for me because I'm a little bit too busy right now, but uh, to get a feedback from the community and, and think about something exciting. Yeah. Or what I did uh, during the AHEX actually, during um, what, I, what I started, small project called um, SPG Static Patch, Page Generator because I had to maintain all the dates for the upcoming workshops and it just does it for me. So I started a small NAS one project. So just do something and, ha and have fun with it. And I would never start with you know, uh, reading uh, uh, books, not even my book, right? So st start hex, um, hex software first, and then if you have some questions, um, read the book. <laughs> so um, assume that they have Java as in knowledge, yes. And what you should do always, business first. What I see over and over again, uh, the beginners start with a framework. So they, they, they start with a logging framework, configuration framework, a DTO mapping framework, uh, what else? Um, just frameworks, you know, you don't, you learn nothing about the Java E if you start with a framework. So you will learn that uh, CDI is uh, pretty powerful, but you will have no idea how to apply it to a real world scenario. So you need challenging application first and go for it and build something great with Java E. Oh, next question from Abhishek. Lots of questions from Abhishek. So I will go with the next one and then skip. So um, manage beans, JSR, 316 and CDI. What are the difference between both? So I think the Abhishek should be all online. So let's see. Oh, my uh, Davide, uh, I think, thank you for asking, but I hope the question is answered. If not, you have time just to write another tweet and um, let's see, uh, say answered, then <laughs> is answered. Otherwise we will meet next month. So, um, JSR316. So, and if you go to um, uh, preview, 
at preview. <laughs> this is my PDF viewer. And I will just open this. So I just, what, what I did, I just opened my uh, the specification, the GSR 316. And what's the difference? First, this is, I think, the leanest spec ever. It comes with 22 pages. And it was created afterwards and extracted from, from the component models. And it basically states, you know, the life cycle, post-construct, pre-destroy, at resource injection, very basic things. But it says, for example, in the basic component model, managed beans must provide a no argument constructor, but a specification that builds and so forth. So you see, okay, no argument a constructor comes from this. And specification that builds on managed beans, such as CDI JSR 299. So what it means is CDI uses managed beans. So whatever you do in CDI is called CDI managed beans, and CDI builds upon um, this specification. So I think it is impossible to have a CDI, uh, um, CDI application without having managed beans. Correct me if I've wronged someone from the spec, but I think it is impossible. Also, all EJBs are managed beans. So um, you always have managed beans, and this is just a subset. One, why it was defined? Um, because um, uh, JSF also uses managed beans. So and now all the you know all the modules from Java E can 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 have something in common, and this common interface is managed bean specification. But as developer, you don't have really to care about. And um, why DI is included in CDI? The I spec enough? What's the main difference? I think the next question is there is jcp.org. This is the 330 specification, the famous one, which was designed by Rod Johnson from Spring Source back then. This is this add inject, and this is the same story. So add inject came after Java E, or, or Java E was almost released, and DB dependency injection for Java came out. And what I did is they change all the internal annotations and replace this with uh, add inject here because the uh, originally I think in Java is six they used the add in from seam and it was replaced by add inject and uh, yeah and this is why you cannot have dependency injection without GSR 330 so 330 we have 299 which is which uses uh, 330 for dependency injection and manage beans 316 for manage beans. But as a developer, don't care about this, just use 299 and EJBs and you are fine. So, uh, GSS is too fast and complex. Okay, this is uh, the next question from Abishan, a little too much. Uh, let's see what a Twitter says, and probably we will have to postpone this for the next session. Otherwise, we will spend several hours here talking about stuff. Ah, very curious. So um, if you're okay with it, Abhishek, we, I will answer whatever you like in May. But uh, let's see what... So just, this is a larger topic, so I wouldn't start with it. So, but um, I think the point with JSF is JSF is extremely productive for simpler apps. The more complex the application becomes, the more you have to know about JSF and the and the and the even HTML. And one point, if you can build everything by yourself, or you at least use JAXRS and st stuff like this. And um, so I would say, what I always do for not so challenging applications, I would always go with JSF. But um, if you have to do cutting edge web development, you have to go with plain HTML5. JAXRS and some JavaScript frameworks, but not with JSF. This was my personal opinion. And this is sometimes it's hard to estimate whether it is going to be a uh, cutting edge project or uh, or just you no know, usual uh, database or <laughs> database table explorer. And for table table explorers, I would use uh, probably JSF, but table, no, no, no. Tables are the most challenging thing. So um, Something without any table, <laughs> I would use JSF. And something with uh, crazy tables, I would probably look at the tables from the various component providers first. Okay. Um, so this question is depending what you are, whether you're encrypt or decrypt on the provider. And if you look on Mohara, for instance, you will find a lots of um, internal implementations, whether this uh, state saving is encrypted or even compressed or not. This is a um, specific implementation. And the next one, I use custom composition components in Facelet. So what he does, it's, it's Bartek seems to using 
um, uh, modules um, and uh, what you and, the, and he would like to share the entities between the the components and to share entities is fairly, fairly simple you you, uh, you could like I think this is the problem some of this commas to all wars yes so um, what you can do you can just put the entity straight in a jar if you put the entities in a jar um, they will and 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 create a Maven project. What you can then do, the war can 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 relate to this to this jar, and um, th there could be some problems because uh, in uh, the war could probably ignore the entities. But what you can you can do, you can specify in the war persistence XML, and point to the jar. If you point to the jar the entities will be found. So again, you, you can create a jar with just entities, no persistence XML. Then you put persistence XML in a war, and within the persistence XML in a war, you can point to the jar where the entities actually are defined. I hope the question is clearly answered. So the last look at Twitter. There is a... Okay, there are no further questions. Let's see at the stream. Nothing else? So um, I would say thank you for watching. And for me, it was great because I saved right now, I think, three hours. Answered all the questions via emails and whatever. And uh, so we, I spent one hour talking, but um, I actually thought we were able to do it in 50 minutes. But... Um, I decided to do it at every first month of the year. And um, you see here, the next is going to be at the May the 5th at 6 p.m. So you can, um, you can define uh, your, um, your questions and, um, uh, or send me the questions via, via um, Twitter, uh, post a comment to my blog or, um, or whatever, hit me on conferences or something. And I will try to gather all the questions and post them one week before. I was a little bit too early today, but one, one, um, one week before. Uh, one week before. And then you can just put your questions on the comments and it will answer everything at, in, at once. And if you have interest, um, you can also visit the air hacks. This is, uh, I do it three times a year on workshop in Munich Airport. So you see it behind me. And uh, I hope, so we had lots of time, fun with the attendees, and uh, I hope it was productive. So we spent five days discussing from beginning of Java E to HTML5, whatever possible, in one week, with an uh, event with uh, microbrewery and Airbroy. So um, this, this event will be repeated. The next time is Wednesday in July, and everyone is invited. So, um, so if, you, if you would have some questions, just come, take a beer, and ask the question. Okay, thank you for watching and see you on May the 5th. And at Saturday, I will give a, a keynote, virtual keynote on a conference called Dev Crowd is in uh, um, Stettin. And what I will do during the keynote, I will actually explain how to, how to tackle Java 7, how to not only learn Java 7, how to be um, productive and maintainable with Java 7. And I will plan also to... to um, to explain the mystical entity control boundary pattern. So thank you for watching. Bye.